I'm not in the business of uh, editing other people's remarks, but we should make clear at the outset that uh, the reason I'm here is because I really miss teaching law school classes. It's uh, my good fortune it's a basketball game tonight, but I am here to teach. Uh, <laughs> spent a lot of years teaching at uh, Georgetown, uh, and I do actually, of all the things I've missed in government, uh, certainly the opportunity to teach has been uh, the most important to me personally. Uh, so it, it really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, it is an interesting time in antitrust, and it's uh, an interesting time uh, for uh, the global economy, I think. And what I'd like to do is just take some time before I answer all your questions about uh, Microsoft and everything else uh, that you want to know about, uh, to sort of talk to you about the global economy of the 21st century, where I think we are, and to say something about the intersection of antitrust. Uh, at the end of these comments, I'm actually going to show you a few minutes of a film which was taped for us by an undercover agent uh, that we wired uh, video and audio to uh, blow up a cartel involving uh, lysine. And uh, it's a kind of particularly sweet story for me because uh, as Clark said, I took over this job for Man Bingaman, who had actually also been a former law partner of mine. And I was in the job three weeks when this cartel, which I will show you, uh, led to a hundred million dollar penalty against Archer Daniels Middle in a guilty plea. ADM was one of the most powerful companies in America, and we had never gotten a fine anything remotely like that. Our highest fine up until then had probably been something in the neighborhood of 15 million. So this was really monumental, and I, of course, was fortunate enough to show up, take over the job about three weeks before, and I was on all the network, I'd never been on network television, I was on all the TVs that night with Janet Reno uh, proclaiming this great victory, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden I heard from people I'd never heard from in 30 years, you know, a couple of sort of high school girlfriends who said you'd amounted to something more than we expected. Uh, <laughs> so I was feeling pretty good, you know. And the next day, of course, op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal says, uh, hey, Joel, this is the land of the free. Goes on to really excoriate me for not understanding markets and capitalism and for being the person who's going to single-handedly drag down the American uh, economy. And this was kind of, uh, even amidst my euphoria, a harbinger of things to come, which was, uh, that antitrust enforcement was not going to be a bed of roses, because this was, as you will see from the movie at the end, I, I save it for the end, so it's an incentive to let you sit here through my remarks. Uh, but as you will see, uh, if this one could bring uh, that kind of reaction, uh, who knows what, what would uh, lie ahead, and, and I've now learned the hard way. But the interesting thing, I came home from work that night, and I was still on balance. Uh, there had been enough positive play. Uh, that I was feeling okay, and my then 12-year-old daughter, uh, about 11 and a half year old, walks up to me and says, you know, hey, Daddy, I saw you were in the paper today. And I thought to myself, first thing I thought is, you know, what kind of 11-year-old reads the Wall Street Journal? You know, and then I realized, well, this is a price you pay if you send your kids to school with Republicans. So I quickly moved past that, and I started to think, how am I going to explain to an 11-year-old that these awful things about me are not true? And as I was thinking of the things I might say, she looked at me and she said, you know, Daddy, she said, you're just like Madonna. And I said, what? And she said, you're just like Madonna. She said, look at this thing. It says, hey, Joel, this is the land of the free. She says, you know how few people in America are known only by their first name? So from that moment forward, I have always thought, the good publicity, the bad publicity, I take it all. But if my daughter thinks I am like Cher or Madonna, it is <laughs> worth every minute in government. Now, what I really want to talk to you about is what I view as something that is truly remarkable going on in the world in which we live. Indeed, I think it is so profound that I don't think any of us are fully able to grasp its historical significance. I actually have a social view of the Heisenberger uncertainty principle of physics. That principle is that certain events cannot be, physical properties cannot be, quote, truly observed because the mere act of observation changes their physical properties. I think there are certain sociological events 
that cannot be truly perceived by people going through them because their power is more overwhelming than our capacity to understand. And I hate to be hyperbolic, but I actually think we are at such a period in history in terms of the transformation of our economy in ways that nobody would have anticipated or predicted. I mean, the obvious points which you read about all the time, the significance of which I assure you, you don't fully appreciate, is that for years we were told we could not have this kind of steady, uninterrupted growth in our economy. We certainly couldn't have it with the kind of low unemployment we're seeing and the kind of minimal, almost non-existent inflation. All the economists told us this was inconceivable, and yet it keeps going forward. Another indication, to give you just some order of magnitude, I don't want to bore you with data, of what we're going through. In 1992, the last year of the Bush administration, before Clinton came to office, in America, the total dollar value of merger activity was $75 billion for the year. Today, we see $75 billion mergers by a single company. AOL Time Warner was twice that. We've got a handful that are bigger than that before the antitrust division today. And last year, 1999, seven years after that number, from 75 billion to 1 trillion five, a 20 time increase. That is massive economic reordering and restructuring, the implications of which we cannot fully foresee. And I want to touch on some of those later. It's clear to me that there are two things that are driving this that people didn't predict. One is the role of technology, whether it's going to be sort of technology in terms of computerization, in terms of delivery of uh, communications through broadband or what have you, that piece, or whether it's biotechnology, those two pieces are quite extraordinary. And the second and related piece is globalization. Taken together, I submit to you, we are at a time in history, in global history, that occurs once a century, if that. This is akin to a transformation like the uh, Industrial Revolution that we went through uh, uh, more than 100 years ago. Now, I think there is a critical economic truth here, and it is remarkable that the world now realizes it, because for the longest time, it went unrealized. And it's as simple as this. Competition works in economics. Competition is the engine that drives an economy in a way that enables us to go through the global transformation we are going through today. Now, this is a very critical point and one that seems more obvious today than it did certainly 30 years ago when I was in law school or even a decade ago. What do I mean by that? People used to debate whether free markets were the right way to organize your economy. For years, we had this fight between communism and socialism on the one hand, truly government-directed economies, and free market capitalism on the other. It is now universally agreed that government-directed uh, economies simply cannot survive in the growing interconnected competitive economy of the 21st century. What's more remarkable is that all the other forms of managed capitalism, which had so much cachet during the decade of the 80s are now all lagging and thought to be unsustainable in the 21st century. If you look at, for example, in Europe, where there was a very producer-driven view, we ought to bulk up our companies, make them national champions to compete on the global stage. In Asia, we saw in Japan this sort of state private economy through METI and the organization of the Keiretsu in Japan as a way to compete, the Chai Bowl in Korea. And I remember a decade ago, at every conference that I was at, people talking about the 21st century as the Asian century. And yet, I just got back from the World Economic Forum at Davos, and one of the things I fear most is the resentment toward the United States because it is now clear that the United States will be the economic juggernaut of the 21st century. How did that happen? It is this simple truth that we have had the greatest commitment to atomistic competition. We have had the only historical commitment, now 110 years old, to antitrust enforcement. We used to be laughed at 
both by our own businesses and certainly by foreign uh, uh, governments who thought that antitrust was this kind of shackle that we put on American, company, American companies in a competitive environment. As it turns out, it is that kind of atomistic competition that has become the true engine driving our position in technology and biotechnology and so forth. It is the ability to raise the kinds of venture capital that allows this sort of atomistic competition to lead to leapfrogging technologies to our position in the software industry, in the computer industry more broadly, and even yet more broadly than that, in the vast communications industry. Going back to things like a very conservative, Clark talked about how antitrust was, used to be moribund, but in its darkest days, during the beginning of the Reagan administration, when Bill Baxter, a very conservative Stanford economist, became head of the division, it was he who had the foresight to break up ATT. And if you look now and see where we are on telecommunications, broadband, broadband access, and really every place but wireless, it is extraordinary. And compare that to Deutsche Telekom, which was basically a state-supported, uh, uh, state, uh, uh, in some respects, state-run telephone company, NTT in Japan, French Telecom, Telecom Italia, and so forth. It is extraordinary. We have this range of powerhouses where we've got ATT, for example, moving into the cable business. We have companies like WorldCom, MCI, unheard of five, six years ago, now clearly global powerhouses. And further, our belief in this view is so powerful that across the board, we have moved away from regulated industries to deregulation. And when you see this, it's one thing to see it in surface and air transportation. It's a very different thing to see it when you're talking about sort of telephones into the home. Even Bill Baxter in 1982 thought it was impossible to break up the local telephone monopoly. Today we are breaking that up, and soon we will break up the electricity monopoly into the home as well. On the theory that the competitive juices unleashed is what is going to keep our economy dynamic. And the rest of the world is now playing catch up. The Keiretsu, which was the backbone of the Japanese economy, they cannot dismantle fast enough. The Chai Bowl, the engine of the great early years of the uh, great uh, uh, early years of this decade in Korea, they can't dis dismantle them fast enough. And there is an understanding in the global economy today that things will move far too quickly for governments to be able to regulate their economy and that those economies will succeed that are most willing to stimulate innovation through competition to incent people to see if they can move a little bit ahead of the pack to get a certain kind of market advantage. Now I say this is amazing because People don't appreciate the significance. There is no way you can put this genie back in the bottle. It will be almost impossible a decade from now to have regulation of markets once deregulated. And if you go through the world today, in conferences I attend, in private meetings that I do with my counterparts in Europe and Asia, everybody wants the American elixir. Give me more competition. Let us get ready to play in this increasingly treacherous economy. Now, there are going to be real costs to that, but the first point I want to submit to you and hope you understand and remember because it'll have enormous implications for your own lives, this force cannot be constrained. Globalization and economic power is such that this competitive dynamic is here to stay. And you won't see a, an historical reversal even in your lifetimes, which will be a lot longer with all that's going on in biogenetics right now, you will not see an historical reversal of this phenomenon. The second point, and the reason I beat this drum so loudly, is that contrary to what a lot of people think, free markets will not remain free without government intervention. And this is something that, again, I think Clark mentioned in his uh, introductory comments, people used to think antitrust was an anachronism. In part, that's because people think the real world, and this is one reason I want to show you the tape, the real world is like a bell jar in which if you can model something and understand the model, 
you can understand the complexity and nuance of human behavior. But the real world is far more sticky than a simple economic model. And while I do believe that antitrust in the 60s in the United States made some serious mistakes, the response to it was a clear overreaction, saying that the free market would always adjust and circumvent the problems of market power in the market because there was an economist model that might explain how it could be done. Economist models are very critical to what we do in our business. It's very critical to understand that competition means there'll be winners and losers and people can get hurt in competitive markets. And our job is not to level the playing field so that everybody can survive. But our job is to make sure that competition on the merits and not the use of market power is what drives the economy. And you can think about it any way you want, but take the simplest example. If you have two gas stations in a town and there's a zoning ordinance so you can't create any more gas stations, those two gas stations compete, it'll drive down the price of gas. They merge or they agree on the price, you're going to pay a lot more money for gas. It is that simple. By the same token, if you have a technology that has become the standard, whether it's on the desktop as in computing or whether it's uh, with respect to uh, VCRs or digital machines or what have you, when you innovate, you want to preserve your dominant position. It is only other people who want to innovate around your position. And what we want to make sure is that the competition is on the basis of the merits of the innovation and not the pre-existing market power. And it is that fundamental concept as long as people compete for your loyalty, your support, your recognition, and your dollars based on the merits, not only will that serve consumers, but it will drive the economy in a positive, strong way. And so what we are doing now is three critically important types of enforcement. And those of you who are looking for a thing to do when you get out of law school, there is no more rich and rewarding experience for young lawyers in practicing at the antitrust division. We are at the cutting edge of global intervention. We are mixing law and economics in a way that is a very rich, combustible, dynamic pursuit. And finally, we are in court doing things at a time when people wonder about whether government is capable of executing. And of all the comments I ever get on Microsoft, the ones I like best or when people walk up to me and say, I don't know you, I don't know who you are, and I don't like what you're doing, but it is nice to see the government execute every now and again. <laughs> so the three things that are going to be at the hub of this global economy, the three legitimate forms of government intervention in the economy, and I'm not talking about for things like pollution or worker safety. I'm talking about economics, pure and simple. There are going to be three fundamental things that governments do. One is to break up cartels. What are cartels? Just like that gasoline example I gave you before. When you're facing rigorous competition, the incentive to fix prices and allocate markets is so high because otherwise, particularly in commodity products, such as vitamins, which is one we broke up recently, where we're talking about vitamins at the wholesale level, there are no brand recognition. This is not Coke versus Pepsi. These are commodities. They're like wheat or barley or grain. And the price of that stuff is very hard. You know, it's not like people prefer Cheerios to Tony the Tiger. There's, you don't have that kind of brand differentiation. You can drive that price very low. Good for, good, good for consumers, good for the economy. And so the people in those industries, especially if there are only four or five major players, they get together and fix prices and allocate markets. And there will always be a need to have antitrust enforcement to break those up. Now, what I said before, again, is important. The economists said, and there were a number of articles written about this, oh, we don't need antitrust enforcement because these cartels, people will cheat on them. So if you and I say we'll fix the price at a dollar and you're supposed to sell 10,000 units and I'm supposed to sell 10,000 units, I'll sell 11,000 units and the thing will disintegrate and so they're inherently unstable. Our investigations at the Justice Department have shown time and again that these conspiracies last for decades. We just broke up a vitamins conspiracy. All the vitamins that are sold in the United States 
principally come through price-fixed arrangements where I believe, I couldn't put a precise number on it, but 15, 20% inflation. In other words, people are getting ripped off for every buck of vitamins you buy, 20 cents, right on the front end as a basis of this cartel. The three leading players in this deal are three of the most prominent, distinguished European companies that were Hoffman La Roche, a great Swiss company, BASF, a great German company, and Roland Polanc, a great French company. And these people, even with antitrust enforcement, went ahead and fixed prices for a decade. We had another one recently we broke open involving a, ma a major American corporation I mentioned at the outset, Archer Daniels uh, Midland, a very prominent corporation which fixed the price of several key farm products uh, that, that were being sold in the farm belt uh, to farmers who are struggling to survive in the global economy. The second form of antitrust enforcement that will be there and has to be there is merger enforcement. And especially if you look at the numbers we're looking at today, we are seeing mega mergers that are unparalleled, whether it's AOL, Time Warner, last week in Europe, Vodafone, Monisman. Uh, we looked at, uh, so we've got ATT Media One before us right now, uh, and I can name a dozen uh, others. Many of these mergers are going to be good for the economy because they position people with the right synergies for the 21st century. Some of them are not going to be good for the economy, and our job is to weed out the good from the bad, whether it was Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop Grumman, which was a defense merger that we blocked. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission, our sister agency, is in court right now on a major uh, gas merger between BP Amico and Arco. Uh, and obviously, as we move forward, uh, there will be others. It is a critical, it is a critical form of enforcement because you want to incent people to innovate not to acquire. Now, there are a lot of acquisitions that can help you innovate and help you expand your market, but you need to be careful in that regard. And the third thing, which I think has been the most controversial, but in some ways perhaps the most important, is this issue of monopolization, single firm behavior. Up until now, what I've been talking about is two firms or more, getting together in a cartel, getting together to merge. Single firm behavior is the hardest area we face and perhaps the greatest philosophical challenge we have with respect to antitrust enforcement today. But I believe it is absolutely critical because in an interconnected world, in a world that's run by standards, we're going to see more monopolization, not less than we did in the past century. And if you look at the three principal monopoly cases we have today, Microsoft on a desktop, Visa MasterCard with respect to credit cards, and American Airlines with respect to its hub in Dallas. The three things these things have in common are fundamentally network type effects. That means that the more of a product you sell, the more you're able to sell. So if you and I, we could have a great credit card system, but if we don't have all the people in the world at the stores willing to accept our card, we can't get any traction. I mean, that's why you see these advertisements that says, you know, Visa is accepted here, but American Express is not. So this is a game in which the more you have, the more you get. Because the more stores we get, the more people buy our card. The more people buy our card, the more stores you get. Because the stores don't want to take a card that only one out of 100 people have. It's a hassle for them. So if I can get up to 90 out of 100, the stores will take it. But I can't get the people unless I get the stores and vice versa. This is what's called a positive feedback loop. Same thing in operating systems. If you don't have a lot of operating system out there, people aren't going to write apps for them. People are going to write the apps for the dominant operating system. But if you don't have a lot of apps, you can't have an operating system because people won't buy your operating system. So why is Linux having trouble getting traction on the desktop? Because it has far fewer applications that are written to it than Microsoft. And this is, again, a positive feedback loop in which you sort of race in place by reinforcing your dominant position. Same kind of thing in American Airlines. And it's not just true for American. All these hub airlines, once you have enough flights converging in a city, the benefits to your airline are extraordinary because two things happen. One, 
Lots of people arrive at the same time, you can move them out quickly. If you want to go, as everybody knows, any place in the south, basically, you've got to go through Atlanta. But if you've got enough traffic in Atlanta, the people all arrive at a particular time, you can move people very efficiently. If you had, for example, 10% of the flights arriving in Atlanta that Delta has, or 10% of the flights that American has, then you can't have the same sort of efficient network. And so what that's called is essentially network effects. And because of those, and that's very different, you think about when you sell cars or other phenomena. When you sell cars, you sell them one at a time. Somebody buys a Mercedes, that may influence your decision, but the value of the network doesn't become much stronger because other people have a Mercedes, as long as there's a threshold to be able to get your car service. It's an entirely different phenomena with network effects and standardization. Basic principle, you could have the greatest telephone in the world, could be crystal clear and you could give it away for pennies a day, but if other people aren't on your network, who's going to buy it? Only people who like to talk to themselves. So th this is the phenomena that is going to become a critical driver in the 21st century, and I do think has been illustrated by our litigation with Microsoft, Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. And those areas of antitrust enforcement are not just going to be critical in the United States, but globally. A decade ago, we were the laughing stock for having antitrust enforcement. Today, 85 countries are now in the business of antitrust enforcement. The World Trade Organization is trying to move into the business of antitrust enforcement. And throughout the world, if you want to be a global lawyer, take antitrust, take it with Terry Calvani, take it next year when Clark teaches it. If you want to be a global lawyer, the demand for antitrust skills are enormous. In Europe right now, they are retooling at such an incredibly rapid rate. And as I see it, in this field, we're going to have two significant problems, challenges that we're facing right now. The first is this problem of how do you do antitrust enforcement when you have a hundred different nations trying to intervene in a single global economy. This is no longer like we can do a hospital merger in the United States, Europeans can do one in France, you know, because hospitals are a local market. The critical markets in the world today are going to be global. People think about telecommunications and communications, but anybody who is in that business, whether you're NTT in Japan, whether you're Deutsche Telekom or ATT, you are thinking globally because you want to have the dominant global network because these are going to link increasingly so. And so being a dominant player in the U.S. alone will not be uh, sufficient. And yet the risk is that you have multiple agencies interfering in the same market. And that, that is a serious problem, one that uh, we are still wrestling to think through. The second serious problem is just one of time. How do you move at warp speed? Even in a case like Microsoft, which we brought probably the major antitrust case of the last 20 years, certainly, and certainly one of the three or four in the history of antitrust enforcement, we brought that case from filing through completion of the judge's findings of fact in about a year and a half, which for an antitrust case is unheard of. And yet, there's a great deal of movement in the market that goes forward even as you litigate. And even though the court committed itself and used very sort of ingenious ways to deal with the problems, limiting each side to 12 witnesses, et cetera, et cetera, move the case very quickly, you need to be aware of the time of intervention and the effects on the market. This is not to say that the problem goes away. Some people like to spin this as saying, well, that shows there's no role for us, the problem will go away. It doesn't mean that. It means, in fact, that market power can ossify, barriers to entry can be heightened before the government is able to do anything about them. And so that is a real challenge that we need to face. I believe the strength of Americans, America's antitrust regime has been the fact that we've been in court for 100 years. Unlike a lot of countries, we can't just assert power. Anybody's free to litigate with us, and if they beat us, they beat us. But the legitimacy of what we do is in judicial vindication. On the other hand, judicial vindication takes time. Now let, let me leave you, before I show you some of this movie, to give you some flavor of what I consider the real world of uh, business transactions. Uh, let me leave you with uh, some very personal uh, thoughts, because this is a time in which, if you follow both halves of my speech, 
that is the dynamics in the market and the role of antitrust enforcement. Most people are more interested in the former than the latter. That is, most people want to own a dot-com when they're 22 or 23 years old. And the big challenge is not to be a millionaire by the time you're 30, it is to be a billionaire by the time you're 30. And I think that's very exciting and very sexy and people ought to go for it. What I worry about is that in the academies today, and certainly among young people, the commitment to public service to deal with the second half of that equation. How do we integrate antitrust enforcement in a global economy? How do we deal with these issues about timeliness? How do we make sure that the government has the quality of people to make the decisions that are so critical? Because if you don't have this integration of government and capitalism, you're going to pay a huge price. The problem in Russia right now is they have rampant capitalism with no governmental infrastructure. And they are paying an enormous price. And if people think you can do this with markets but without government, people have no understanding <coughs> of history. And the issues I'm raising are only the tip of the iceberg. The questions that we are going to face in the midst of economic plenty and enormous opportunity are going to be profound cultural, psychological, ethical, and even moral questions. The division between the haves and the have-nots, not just in our own country, but throughout the world, can become much more acute in this kind of what I view as irreversible global race. The dislocations to human beings. You know, it was only 50 years ago that most people thought that they would do one job throughout their lives. Whether it was the quaint mill town, or the coal mine, or the automobile company, Today, that is increasingly going to become less and less real for people. People are going to be independent contractors with, quote, a word or a series of words I hate, skill sets that they can adapt. This will create a great deal of personal opportunity, but also a great deal of anxiety and dislocation. Issues of security will become critical in the world. These issues of how we, whether we tax the net, and if so, when, how we interact with developing countries, these demand the best and the brightest in our country. And if you don't understand that this country, because of its infrastructure, because of its commitment to democracy, because of its willingness to try to deal with the tough issues for all its faults, has given us the opportunity to have this global position with all the economic riches that attend it, if you don't understand that that don't come for free, and if people like you don't start to think about your obligation to give back, that public service, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or whatever, is and will remain the highest and best calling. When I think about whatever their party, the people like Dick Cheney, the people like George Shultz, like Bob Rubin, like Bill Perry. These people came not to make money, not to advance their cause, their fame, or anything. They came for one simple reason, to serve a nation that had given them limitless opportunity to exploit their individual potential and capacity. And I hope all of you, as you think about making that first billion before 30, think a little bit about what your long-term commitments are to the really difficult, intractable, non-economic issues that we're going to face as a nation. All right, with that, let me now see if I can, how do I turn this thing on? Let me just, before we turn it on, take a half a second to tell you what I'm going to show you, because we don't usually show this, but since I'm in a classroom, I'm going to do it. This is, we, we had a guy who came to us that told us that he was active in a worldwide cartel essentially to fix the price and allocate markets on the sale of lysine. Lysine is a food and feed additive that farmers use uh, in terms of uh, uh, care for their uh, uh, livestock on the farm. It's a commodity. It's hard to differentiate. These people belong to a global association of food and feed additives. They set up a lysine subgroup. 
They manufactured agendas to pretend they were dealing with real world issues and they met and we had somebody in there with a camera filming what was going on. And I will try to just narrate a little bit. I'm going to show you probably about uh, five, six minutes of this thing. Um, we had hundreds and hundreds of hours of these meetings, ultimately led to a hundred million dollar judgment we got against Archer Daniels Midland. All right. Is there a way to turn up the sound at all? all right, these are the people from the various companies. They're sitting in a hotel room now. It's actually RTV filming them. They didn't know that. Two other companies. These are two uh, Asian producers. <laughs> One from the FBI. This guy doesn't know he's being filmed. <laughs> Seven from the Federal Trade Commission. Even in Europe, they're cracking down on cartels. This is a guy from Archer Daniels Midland.
See, these guys said they, they dip below the agreed on price. We turn on the lights. On him, so. As long as there's behavior like that in the world, let me see if he's. I suspect there'll be a role for those of you in antitrust uh, enforcement. Uh, why don't I take, if you have any questions in the time that remains, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, I had a question about uh, a decision or that may have been made in, in, in your shit against Microsoft. You've emphasized innovation, yet, at least as it was publicly reported, um, there was very little evidence adduced about, uh, for instance, the uh, suppressive effect Microsoft's behavior has on venture capitalists, the number of things that weren't brought to market. Uh, it's, it's, for instance, acquisition of Hotmail and then failure to develop it. It's acquisition of the extreme, and then it uh, tries to pull um, non-competitive strategies against uh, real audio. And I was just curious, why was there so much focus on the Netscape and not a broader focus on its non-competitive behavior, particularly its suppression of, of products? Exactly as you say, things that could get developed, and people just didn't fund them because they said, well, Microsoft will crush you, or Microsoft may do it, or they'll buy you out before there's any return on our 
I guess. Well, I'd say two things without, you know, the case is still pending, so I want to be careful what I say. The first thing I'd say in that regard is I think we had three clear examples of significant competitive impairment. One, the court made specific findings on a product that uh, Intel was uh, developing called native signal processing, which would have facilitated use of the thin client on the desktop, which Microsoft actually froze out of the OEM channel. And that product never came to market at all. The other two products that were clearly affected uh, and could have had, again, significant uh, implications in this market were both middleware products. The browser, which when it started out was designed to expose APIs as a way for people to write applets uh, that could have again facilitated a very different kind of computing experience and of course cross-platform Java which was also impaired by uh, according to the court's finding by anti-competitive prices uh, practices. But the biggest problem and this is this is a uh, been a hard thing for us to explain. The biggest problem is the thing you're talking about, which is the products that don't come to market because it's in a, in a space that Microsoft can leverage its desktop into and take you out of. And indeed, one of their COO, their, their COO, one of their key employees, said in an interview when asked, if you were a startup company thinking about moving into a space in which Microsoft could bundle that space into its operating system, what would you do? And he said, basically, looking at the odds, I would stay out of the market. It is that problem, the people who, the VC money that doesn't go into adjacent spaces, uh, that I think the court, listening to all the evidence, looking at all the documents, uh, made findings about that. But uh, by definition, I can't prove what innovations uh, they were. And there's also the other problem of particular people, venture capitalists, and whether they're willing to come forward and testify in a situation uh, like that, where there's a lot of market power uh, in the market. Uh, if I kind of grasp antitrust correctly, which I'm not very familiar with, but companies can bring antitrust suits against other companies, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. Um, how, does, how well does it, how efficiently, effectively does that system work? Um, I don't hear about that very much, and, and I'm wondering if there is anything in the works to try and make that a little bit more effective, or, or if only the power and money of government is able to um, it's, I don't think it's the power and the money. It's just that most people who are in business, when they bring private actions, are principally focused on the dyadic economic relationship. If you're a competitor and somebody's hurting you, what you're trying to do is you're, you want to do business. You don't want to stick around to, quote, fix the market, which is impaired by anti-competitive practices. I think principally only the government has that long-term market-based pro-consumer interest. And so when it comes to key antitrust enforcement, although there will always be private actions, key antitrust enforcement inevitably is going to be done by the government. Not so much because we have the big bucks. I mean, there are a billion companies out there. Our budget's $100 million a year. There are companies that, uh, whose market cap went up uh, three times that in between 3.30 and 4 today. So uh, it, it's not the money. It's just the focus and the commitment. Other questions? This uh, radical change in the market that you talked about at the beginning and the, the place where we are now, I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit why you think that it's happened now versus um, why has it taken our uh, economy in the United States and the world in general this long to get to this point? Principally, I think technology is really, I think it's, it is like the Industrial Revolution. I think the technological revolution really whether it's Moore's law and the power of the chip that doubles every 18 months but the capacity to be able to hook up the world in a single unified communication system was simply unimaginable. I, I remember when Daimler uh, uh, bought Chrysler, when Mercedes bought Chrysler, it was just that would have been unthinkable 15, 20 years ago but now because communications, CNN I mean, you can just think about it. when I grew up, I didn't watch people fighting wars. You know, you, you saw films that came back. You know, CNN is now part of the first uh, ship that lands, the first uh, uh, troops that are on the ground. It's a phenomenal sort of truncating of the uh, world. And that coupled with the technological developments has just uh, caused, I think, a, uh, 
uh, what Andy Grove calls an inflection point in our global economy. How, how is the government evaluating or weighing uh, the competing factors between globalization, the presence of competitors in a global economy versus the, the presence of competitors in the U.S.? And you mentioned AT&T, for instance, how you broke them up to create competition in the U.S. It seems like there's a, a, a re-merging of, of companies in PMCI, and Sprint, WorldCom, and in telecommunications. And clearly there's there are uh, global competitors in the other countries, but it's not really a clear question. But no, it's a critical question. It is very hard. I think what you do, the first thing you do is you look at competition on the ground where you are. So if you're doing a, a merger involving uh, major telco companies, you look at its impact on local, on long distance. You look at its impact uh, with respect to uh, uh, wireless. You look at its impact with respect to data, voice, and video. So you've got all those, because wire is going to be, or wireless is going to be a conduit in all those markets. And essentially, if you see any of those areas where you think its impact is anti-competitive, you first deal with that problem. If it's an anti-competitive problem in local markets, you deal with it. Long distance markets, if it's in uh, uh, cell phones, what have you. And sometimes you can deal with that with a small divestiture. WorldCom MCI, which was a huge merger, not the current one with Sprint, but when WorldCom and MCI got together, we did that merger. And the big problem there was internet backbone and the various clients that the that they were sort of two of the four leading internet backbone companies, WorldCom, MCI, Sprint, and GTE at the time. And we were worried that the market would tip and that WorldCom would have a monopoly uh, on internet backbone. And so we ordered a divestiture, essentially, in that case. They, they were sold it uh, to uh, cable and wireless. Uh, at some point, you get into the very hard question where a merger can have good effects in one market and bad effects in another. We tend to focus first on the bad effects and try to deal with them, then on the good effects. But even what you're saying about recombining, People say, well, all the local bell companies got together. Just remember, in 1984, there was ATT, a company that nobody thought could make it, MCI. Today, whatever happens, you've got at least five, six powerhouses, and we've got 150 people like Level 3 and Quest, Intelligent, uh, out there all looking for niches. You can't put this genie back in the bottle. You could not move back toward a monopoly uh, unless we simply abandon merger enforcement altogether in the telecommunications slash communications industry. More interesting, this goes to the last question, is the technology, is that ATT no longer wants its dominant wire to be copper wire. ATT is looking for cable infrastructure, which says a tremendous amount of, about uh, t technology, broadband, and the shifts. Yeah. Going from Silicon Valley to Wall Street, does the antitrust division have have concerns about what's going on with insurance companies merging with banks, so that with you know like Citigroup and Travelers merging together? Is that those are that, that went through? But is there a potential problem if that continues to happen? The it, 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 there's always a potential problem, but in the short run, there's almost no antitrust problem. There there are other issues there about the impact on bank solvency and, and uh, how much you can load up uh, the train. But from an antitrust point of view, these people are entirely different markets. They were forced to be in different markets as a result of Glass-Steagall legislation. Now the barriers come down, they're uh, basically integrating. But like in any field, it can go too far. But for example, bank mergers, we used to, because of regulation, have so many banks in the United States. And uh, while that had a nice, warm, community-based feeling, uh, it really eroded a great deal of efficiency. And so now we have you know, a dozen major players, and that's certainly uh, not a threat at, at this point. But if it got down to three, four, five, obviously, that would be a significant uh, difference. Yes? In the lysine case that you showed, uh, were there criminal prosecutions uh, as well? That case, we got $100 million from, from Archie Daniels Midland. We prosecuted those two, two of the people. The one guy there, Whitaker, he was our source. We prosecuted him. We prosecuted the fellow, his name was Mark. We prosecuted Terry Wilson and 
the third guy who wasn't in that film but who was mentioned, the guy who said you keep your friends close, uh, you keep your enemies close, and your, your friends close and your enemies closer, that was Mick Andreas, who was the son of Dwayne Andreas, the uh, CEO of Archer Daniels Midland. Uh, we finished one of the most powerful, well I want to come back to that point actually, but we prosecuted those people, they each got two years uh, in prison, they're serving time now, the appeal was heard about uh, a week, 10 days ago, but in the meantime, they've served about six, eight months on their sentence. This last point you make about Andreas being uh, the, uh, uh, one of the most powerful political contributors uh, to both Republicans and Democrats uh, is a very interesting one because when this case was going on, uh, there was a lot of leakage and a fortune reporter actually knew a lot about uh, this prosecution. And we were, of course, locked down because it was all grand jury work, but there was a lot of leakage. And I spent a lot of time in Europe and Africa late at night uh, having uh, one last brandy with people who were willing to bet me any amount of money that the United States Department of Justice would not prosecute Archie Daniels Midland, much less prosecute the son of Dwayne Andreas, one of the handful of most powerful uh, political uh, uh, entrepreneurs in the United States. Not only did we do it, but throughout the whole thing, I didn't get a single call from anyone in Congress or from anyone in the political branches and the political uh, sections of the executive saying, what are you doing, why? Not even an inquiry. It says something remarkable about law enforcement in the United States. And Tom Friedman, who uh, writes for the New York Times, said this. This goes back to that little sermon I gave at the end of my comments, uh, which is probably a pretty good place to end here today. So one of, if you were trying to design a country that was not irrationally exuberant about its economy for the 21st century, but was rationally exuberant. There would have been a handful of things you would have done. For example, you would have opened its borders for immigrants to come so that talent could be drawn. You would have a bankruptcy system. You would make sure that its capital was stable, that debts could be enforced, and so forth. And he adds in this list of things, uh, music to my ears, and it would be a country in which even a company as great and successful as Microsoft could be called before the bar of law by a Justice Department lawyer earning $75,000 a year. And I think he was right about that. Uh, and I think that is a unique uh, attribute. And it is very, very hard to replicate that currency in the global economy because, as anybody who studies this knows, producers have so much more political power than consumers who are atomistic, disorganized, you may see people like Dwayne Andrews who will fight for ethanol in Congress, tremendous lobbying campaign for uh, ethanol protection in the Congress. You never see anybody walking around with a poster saying, we want more money for antitrust enforcement. Uh, we have no constituency. The amazing thing is we have enormous bipartisan support. People think of this as a left-right issue. It's a big, big mistake. Some of the critical people in the history of antitrust enforcement in America have been on both sides of the political aisle, going back to Sherman and the original Sherman Act, which was a Republican, to Theodore Roosevelt, the, the president who was most aggressive on antitrust enforcement, uh, paradoxically to uh, uh, some comments last week made by John McCain on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, to people like the current president, uh, like uh, uh, Roosevelt and uh, his antitrust division, uh, 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 which was probably one of the most important. It really has been a truly bipartisan effort. And even today, as controversial as the things that we do are, we enjoy enormous bipartisan support on Capitol Hill, which says a lot about America's, America's commitment to competitive markets. Well, as I said at the outset, it's been a long time. Uh, I was probably a little over the top, but that's because I missed the classroom. Thank you all very much.